Hello, if you were unable to attend the original training um, for the introduction to the MasterPal um, modules, this is uh, for you. So before we get started, if you do not have a yellow or orange folder, please let me know. Um, send me an email and I will get you one. This has the slides for some of the modules and then I'll get out the slides for the remaining modules. Um, there are also some supplemental materials in there. There are two core communication boards. There is a um, communication prompting hierarchy and then the communication bill of rights is also in there. Um, so those are all things that will be useful to you um, in this training. So I'm going to go ahead and share the slides um, so that we can get started. Okay, so um, we are going to be doing this, this first module is basically just an introduction to the concepts of Model as a Master Pal, and we'll be reviewing some um, basics of communication. Okay. So modeling as a Master Pal is uh, we are going to um, support our communication partners by modeling. And then Master Pal stands for motivate, accept multiple modalities, statements more than questions, time, both wait time and time for growth, um, engage naturally, response not required, presuming potential, appropriate prompting, and then letting the child lead. Um, we'll cover each of those different aspects of modeling as a Master Pal. But like I said, today is just a quick introduction to some communication basics. Okay, so a master is a skilled practitioner of a particular art or activity. So you can have master carpenters, you can have master teachers, you can have master whatever. And it can also mean to acquire or complete knowledge or skill in. So we typically think of our kids as mastering skills. So they've mastered uh, two digit addition. Um, so, we have those two aspects of the word master. A pal is a friend, a buddy, a comrade, a companion, a co-conspirator, if you will. Um, so modeling as a master pal is basically learning to be um, the absolute best communication companion you can be to your students um, so that they can learn to communicate. Okay, so the communication bill of rights, if you look in your, um, if you look in your folder, you should have a copy of the Communication Bill of Rights. On one side, it's got just all in text. On the other side, it's got kind of this, um, it's got a version that has some symbol support with it. Um, so the Communication Bill of Rights is a document that was developed by the National Joint Committee for the Communication Needs of Persons with Severe Disabilities. Um, and the Communication Bill of Rights basically just states that all people with a disability of any extent or severity have a basic right to affect, through communication, the conditions of their existence. Um, so they have the right to be communicated with and responded to in a dignified manner, to request, refuse, socially engage, obtain information about the world around them, seek assistance, and have some control over the interactions and activities in which they participate. Um, so we're going to watch a quick video um, about the Communication Bill of Rights. Supportive training, active respect. We've all got some Become a star by learning how to help people communicate. Let's get started. And to reflect. We've all got something to say. There has been a lot of excitement lately about people with disabilities 
gaining increased opportunities to direct their lives by making their own meaningful decisions. How can those of us without typical speech or literacy skills participate in our community? But how will you know what we want? If we cannot tell you, how will you help us to genuinely be a part of our communities? If we don't have the tools to communicate, and neither of us have the training we need. This is where supportive training, training with active respect. respect comes in. The goal of the STAR approach is to train professionals and families in proven ways to foster meaningful communication. Have you heard of the Communication Bill of Rights? It states that all people with a disability of any severity have a basic right to affect through communication the conditions of their existence. I have the right to ask for what I want. I have the right to reject choices. I have the right to share my feelings. I have the right to be given real choices. I have the right to use my communication system all the time. I have the right to be taught and communicate. I have the right to have genuine interaction with others. I have the right to access information and technology. I have the right to be treated with respect. I have the right to be listened to. I have the right to have a working communication system and a backup system. I have the right to know my schedule and my world. I have the right to be spoken to in a dignified manner. I have the right to be spoken to, not spoken about. I have the right to be an equal member of the community. If you presume I am incompetent, you underestimate my abilities. You mean how others perceive me, and you deny me opportunities to learn. That is a very dangerous assumption. We must embrace high expectations for all by using the least dangerous assumption. Instead, if you start by presuming my competence and treat me as someone who understands, it hurts no one and it changes how others perceive me. People who use AAC have told us that they want respect, equality, and genuine interest from their communication partners. They want to have an ease of conversation with those who interact with them. STARS will always remember to presume competence when having a conversation with anyone. Give it a try. You may be surprised at what they can tell you. Okay, so let me get this set back up. Okay, so that video kind of covered the Communication Bill of Rights, why it's important. Um, and we will go ahead and continue. Okay, so AAC. Um, stands for Augmentative and Alternative Communication. I'm sure some of you are familiar with the term. Um, typically, I think people think that AEC is one specific, um, one specific thing that we put into place. So AAC might be an app on an iPad, or AAC might be a dedicated talker, or AAC might be a communication book. But really, AAC is an umbrella term that encompasses the communication methods and tools. So methods being things that people do um, and use. So things like gesturing and using facial expressions 
and then the tools that are used to supplement or replace speech or writing for those with impairments in the production or comprehension of spoken or written language. So we can use AAC to help kids understand, to help students understand what we're saying to them. Okay, so um, when we think about AAC, there's two different types, like two different categories that supports can fall into. We have unaided communication and then aided communication. Unaided communication is things where you don't need to carry anything else on your person in order to use them. So things like eye gaze, which is literally just looking at what you are trying to communicate. So if you need to go to the bathroom, you might just look at the bathroom. Um, using facial expressions and body language, using gestures, oops, sorry, um, using um, sign language, using vocalizations and verbal approximations. So these are things that aren't necessarily words, but that you do with your voice. Um, and that are understood by your communication partner. Um, aided communication is anything that you have to carry something extra in order to use it. So a communication book, a low-tech communication board, any picture symbols that you're using, light-tech devices like a GoTalk, um, high-tech dedicated devices, so things like your Dynavox systems or your Pranky Romich systems, and then mobile devices, so things like phones or iPads, and those, um, both the mobile devices and the high-tech dedicated devices can be symbol or text-based. Really, any of these can be symbol or text-based. I guess picture symbols are just going to be symbol-based. Um, but you could potentially have a low-tech communication board that's text-based as well. Okay, so for the people who attended the in-person training, we did an exercise where um, they had a piece of colored paper in their folder, and you likely, if you have your folder, have a piece of colored paper in there. Um, and what they did was based on the color of the paper, they were supposed to fold their paper a certain number of times in order to give them a certain number of boxes on their paper. Um, so you can, you can do this. Um, I, think it's, I think it's a useful exercise to do. So if you had a pink sheet of paper, you divided your paper into two sections. If you had an orange sheet of paper, you divided it into four sections. Green was eight sections, blue was 16, and yellow was 32. So then once you had your paper divided into sections, each person decided what words they thought would be the most useful for themselves to communicate a variety of things um, across a variety of topics. They picked the words that they wanted on their communication board, the words or the phrases or sentences. Um, they wrote them down. And then we uh, tried to have some conversations. So if you want to pause right now and make your own and then just think about the things, how you would maybe communicate these next topics, um, I think that would be a useful exercise as well. So here we go. These were the things that we tried to talk about using our AAC systems that we had made. We tried to greet our table mates. We tried to request a preferred item or activity, even something that wasn't available. We tried to indicate refusal or dislike, like I don't like that or I don't want that. Uh, we tried to tell about something that had recently gone wrong and we tried to share about our family. Um, I had a pink sheet of paper, which means that I got two words to try to use. The two words that I chose were yes and no, um, and they were not all that useful in participating in these kinds of conversations. So I was able to indicate refusal or dislike by just saying no, um, but I couldn't really greet anybody. And in order to participate in any sort of 
other interactions, somebody would have had to ask me yes or no questions. So about my family, somebody could have asked me, are you married? Do you have kids? Do you have a son? Do you have a daughter? But that's about it. Like I couldn't tell them how old my kids are, that my kids are hilarious, that they um, are also at times infuriating, that I've been married for um, almost 10 years now, but we've been together for almost twice that. So those are all things that I couldn't communicate with just yes and no. So the point of the exercise was to show that like one, we can't anticipate all of the things that kids are going to need to communicate. So what we want to do is give them a robust communication system that will help them um, communicate a wide variety of messages. Okay, so when we talk about communication for a variety of purposes, um, we think about the earliest communicative functions, which are kind of requesting, commenting, social, like developing social closeness and then refusing. So if we're thinking about just the word truck, um, a child might use the word truck to request by reaching for a toy truck and saying truck. Um, they might comment about a truck that's going down the street by pointing at it and saying truck. Um, they might demonstrate social closeness by inviting you to play um, by handing you a truck and saying truck, uh, or they might indicate refusal by just pushing the truck away and being like truck. Um, other important communicative functions include asking questions, responding to things, responding to people, which is really important for school. We expect kids to respond to a lot at school. Um, Sharing information is really important as well. So for sharing information about yourself and then sharing information about the world and about your interests outside of yourself. Okay, so what's communication? Communication is a message that's exchanged between two people, which results in a reciprocal interaction. So communication is a back and forth, right? It's a two way street. The goal of communication is expressing something that your communication partner doesn't know that you're thinking. So that's the important thing. I'm transmitting information from my brain to yours that you don't know already. Um, successful communication is effective, efficient, and socially appropriate. So effective means that it's understood and, it, and your communication partner gives you a meaningful and appropriate response. Efficient means that you were able to express your idea as quickly as possible with the least amount of effort necessary. And socially appropriate means that it's a modality, it's a way of communicating that other people are able to respond to um, in a reasonable manner. So don't confuse social appropriateness with social typical, like socially typical communication. Um, so it is socially typical for people to s respond to a greeting of hello with hi or hello. Um, it's not necessarily typical for somebody to just wave, but it's totally socially appropriate for somebody to just wave. It's not inappropriate. They're still communicating hi, um, just without, without spoken words. Um, another example is expressing I don't want that using words or by pointing to symbols is socially appropriate. Pointing to symbols is not socially typical because typically people are just going to use words. So those both are ways that are socially appropriate. Crawling under a table is not always socially appropriate, right? However, when we think about things that are effective and efficient, so it's not always efficient for somebody to use spoken words or even symbols to communicate something like, I don't like that. I think typically when somebody doesn't like something, it can be very dysregulating. So when somebody is dysregulated, they're less likely to have access to the ability to communicate in a socially appropriate way. So we have to think about decreasing the amount of effort that it takes to communicate in a socially appropriate way, particularly when people are maxed out, when people don't have the resources to um expend effort on getting words out. Okay, so we are going to watch a really quick video of an adorable little nugget named, I think his name is Will. Um, so he's going to give us the same message in three different, three different modalities. Um, and we are going to 
get a chance to see um, how effective, efficient, and socially appropriate each of those modalities is. Oh, just kidding. Let's see. There we go. <laughs> hey, Will, you stay there, okay? When you're in the car, what do you like to watch? Maybe. Can you show me with signs how you say it? No, with signs. Say it with signs. Don't use don't use the iPad yet. How do you sign? Maybe. Maybe. Oh, good job. You want to say it with the iPad? Mm. Okay, what do you like to watch? Uh-oh. <laughs> okay, go ahead. What do you like to watch? Baby signing time. Yeah, baby signing time. Okay, so with Will, we saw that he used three different methods to communicate the exact same thing, that he wanted to watch baby signing time, or that's what he liked to watch in the car. So I'm assuming that's his mom who's sitting with him. Um, and she knows, so for her, for him communicating with her, um, what's effective, efficient, and socially appropriate is going to be far different than if he was communicating with me, somebody that does not know him. Um, so it's effective, efficient, and socially appropriate for him to say baby to his mom when they're in the car um, to communicate that he wants to watch baby signing time because she knows what that means. Um, it's effective, efficient, and uh, socially appropriate for him to use the signs with her if she can see him. Um, if she can't see him, then it's not an effective way of communicating that he wants to watch baby signing time. Um, using the talker, and I wouldn't know that those signs together meant that he wanted to watch baby signing time. So it works for mom, it wouldn't work for me. When he gets out the talker and he says baby signing time, that is pretty clear cut, no matter who he is interacting with, if they understand spoken language, baby signing time on the talker is baby signing time with mom, it's baby signing time with me. Like I understand that as well, even though I am a complete stranger. So it's effective, efficient, and socially appropriate at that point. Okay, so earlier I was talking about a robust communication system after we did the activity with the, um, the folded paper and developing our own communication systems. So what is a robust communication system? A robust communication system um, has quite a few different features. So the first feature is that it has a symbol set that can be learned by our learner. Um, so it's an appropriate symbol set. So it can get into their brain and they can understand it. So for a lot of our students, written language, like written words, is not an appropriate symbol set because it's not something that they have learned or that they may have the ability to learn. Um, at this point in time to get their needs met. For somebody who is blind and cannot use vision to see a symbol set, we would not use picture symbols. Um, that would not be an appropriate symbol set because they cannot see them. So we would have to think of something tactile that they could feel like braille um, or something that they could hear like spoken language. Um, or they make even tactile symbols like that are roughly the shape of something. Um, yeah, so we would have to use a symbol set that they could understand. Um, another example is for individuals who have what's called cortical visual impairment. It's not a problem with their eyes. It's a problem with how their brain understands and makes meaning of what their eyes sends to it, send to it. Um, for individuals who have cortical visual impairment, they have an easier time interpreting high contrast symbols. So symbols that have a black background and then brightly colored lines on them um, that are a little bit simplified. So Mayor Johnson, the um, company that makes picture communication symbols, um, has a high contrast symbol set um, that is a lot easier for students with cortical visual impairment to interpret and to see and to distinguish between the different symbols. Um, 
symbols need to be presented in a consistent, meaningful pattern so that they can be accessed with the least effort. So we want symbols to be stored in the same places all the time. If pretzel is going to be in a snack folder, we always want pretzel to be in that snack folder. We don't want to then move it to a different folder for salty foods. Um, if we have the word go and it's sometimes on the home page and sometimes it's like in a folder for verbs that start with G, that's not presenting those words in a consistent, meaningful pattern. Um, I liken it to if every day you get to work and you hang up your coat on a hook, when you go to leave at the end of the day, you know that your coat's on that hook. If somebody came in the middle of the day and moved your coat off that hook and put it in a locker in the hallway, when you came to get your coat at the end of the day, you wouldn't be able to access it with the least amount of effort because it's not where you thought it should be. It's not where you had um, already established is the place for your coat. So you would need somebody to show you again where your coat is, even though you knew where it was before. It's just that somebody moved it. So we want to make sure that if our if we introduce a symbol in a location, if we move it, that we show the kid where we moved it, um, and then that it's consistent. Um, and we're not always moving, moving where symbols are or changing the pictures associated with them. We want it to be as consistent as possible. It has to have agreed upon rules and patterns designed for developmental growth. So we want to be able to eventually um, introduce syntax and grammar to our kids and our students. Um, we want it to have the ability to grow with them if they get to that point. So adding on word endings like ing and the s at the end of um, at the end of words. Um, we want to uh, we want it to be usable in conversation and discourse for a variety of pragmatic functions. So we typically. Um, so PEX is a system that we typically see introduced with beginning communicators. Um, the concern with PEX is that it's pretty limited when it comes to pragmatic functions. So it starts out just as a requesting system, um, which means that kids who are learning PEX don't necessarily have uh, a way to refuse things in a socially appropriate way. They don't necessarily have a way to comment on things until they get to a certain phase of pecs. And then the comments that they're able to do are pretty limited. So they can't say that something is um, delicious or yummy or yucky. Um, so we want to make sure that we are, kids are able to use their communication systems for a variety of functions. We want to make sure that it's accessible receptively and expressively so they understand um, what the communication system is and that they can use it expressively. So if you have a student who can't use their finger to select icons on the screen accurately, um, then giving them a touch screen is not accessible expressively. Um, we want to make sure that it includes core vocabulary and French vocabulary. So core vocabulary are words that we can use across settings, things like go, want, I, you, um, words that make up about 80% of all the things that we say. And then relevant fringe vocabulary. So fringe vocabulary is going to be the stuff that is more specific to activities and specific topics. Um, so if I'm talking about my family, the names of my family members and the relationships might be fringe vocabulary that I would need. Um, if I'm talking about science uh, and specifically the rock cycle, I might need to know like the different types of rocks, things like that. Um, that would be French vocabulary. I'm not going to talk about igneous rocks outside of a science lesson, typically. Um, there are some limitations with core vocabulary, though. It's really difficult to set topics with core vocabulary, and it's not always um, the most useful for a range of pragmatic functions. Um, full robust systems include things like pod, unity, lamp, words for life, proloquo to go, touch chat, snap core first, which is now called TD snap, and then speak for yourself, and then there's others. Um, 
here at, at Middle Fork, we have most of our students are using um, Lamp Words for Life and then TD Snap. We have um, one student who has chosen to try out Pro Loco to go. Um, so I'm currently learning that system. Uh, it's a little bit it's a little bit trickier for me though. Um, so we have we have students who are learning a variety of some systems. Um, so that is it for the introduction and communication basics. Um, here are some different resources. If you're all at all interested, these are um, included in your slides. These are just different AAC resources. Um, some vendors. And then if you happen to have any questions or comments, I would love if you would email me. Um, I will try to get back to you as soon as possible with a response. Um, other than that, that's it for today. I will have the other modules available hopefully soon. Um, I think that's it. Thanks. Bye.